Welcome. You're listening to Literacy Now, the official podcast for the nonprofit organization Parents for Reading Justice, and I am your host, Brett Tingley. On today's episode, we will be talking to Dr. Jan Hasbrook, a leading researcher, educational consultant, and author who works with schools in the United States and internationally. Dr. Hasbrook worked as a reading specialist and coach for 15 years, taught at the University of Oregon, and later became a professor at Texas A&M. Her research in reading fluency, academic assessment and interventions, and instructional coaching has been widely published. We are so excited to have her here today. Thank you. Is there anything else you would like to share with us about your background before we start? Well, I think those are kind of the professional highlights for sure. Those are probably the the big things that lets people know a little bit about my background. Uh, the the other piece that that I do talk about a lot. It has certainly affected. Uh, my professional career, but also pro- uh, personally, is the fact that um, I have two children, now adult children, and uh, the second, my daughter, has dyslexia. So mm-hmm. I have been one of those parents that are probably part of your key audience. <laughs> We're talking about parents for justice. Um, we know anybody who's experienced having a child who struggles academically, maybe particularly with reading, um, which can be caused by dyslexia, which my, was my daughter's case. But we know these days there are a lot of reasons why children are struggling when they don't have to. And uh, yeah, I've been that concerned, scared, um, uh, sad, <laughs> angry uh, parent myself. So that's, that's the other piece I would add. Well, and I do, that reminds me, my good friend Gail Long and I, who started out together about a decade ago, called you desperate, trying to understand what to do. And I cannot thank you enough for talking with us and being so generous with your time over the years. Thank you. Well, that's, that's lovely. I'm, I'm happy to be there for, (laughs) for folks who are on this journey, trying to, trying as I am to find the right answers because it is, it is a continuous journey. We, even those of us who are very committed and maybe especially those of us who are very committed to evidence-based practice, the challenge with that is the evidence keeps coming and it keeps changing. Not in really dramatic ways anymore. I don't expect that there's research that's going to tell us to make a huge shift in what we've been doing, but the the nuances, the edges of, of things, um, how often, how soon, uh, in what ways do we provide instruction that meets the needs best for our children. Um, if we're really concerned about getting it right, we have to pay attention to the new information that continues to come. So I know for me, it's a uh, many decades journey and it's not, it's not over yet. Well, and, and it's so interesting to me because my background is engineering and business. And so the idea of continuous improvement, when you learn something new, you move to that effortlessly and without guilt or there's no issue. Um, it's, it's amazing to me to see such a difference in the educational universe. So I, I like to talk about just the science of reading or evidence-based reading instruction, meaning that it's, it is what the science is putting out, and that does change. What, what is the science of reading in your definition? Uh, I should have one just memorized that I can I can uh, use. I I do a lot of presentations on this topic, and uh, so I have a PowerPoint slide that I use that has the definition in front of it <clears throat> or on it uh, that I can read. I'm I'm very fond of the work that the Reading League has done. Um, uh, in many different ways, but one of the things they attempted to do um, a year ago or so was to make that definition, to help define what are we talking about when we talk about the science of reading. And and they said uh, that it is a multidisciplinary uh, 
uh, growing uh, body of language, uh, body of evidence that comes, uh, um, it's multidisciplinary in that it comes from medical science, it comes from cognitive science, it comes from um, uh, neuroscience, it comes from behavioral science, where people look at what's happening in classroom situations and those kinds of things. So it's multidimensional, um, focused on uh, both how the brain becomes a reading brain um, and what are the most optimal best practices uh, to help get us there. This research has been conducted for uh, some kind of things that we would call research have been conducted for probably over a hundred years, but it's the last 50 years and particularly the last 30 years where we've actually had statistical and uh, uh, research design methodologies and technology that's allowed the growth of this good factual evidence to really explode. Um, and that, lang that research has been done um, in many languages. Uh, there are researchers working in not just in English, but in uh, the acquisition of reading in other languages. Um, so it's multidimensional, it's multinational, it's, it's focused on both the brain and um, the instructional aspects of it. That's, that would be my definition of the science of reading. And one of the things that's, that's confusing to parents is that all teachers, all reading professionals don't know about the science of reading. Mm -hmm. How did you learn about the science of reading? What was your, how did you discover it or did you always did you start there? Uh, lucky for me, I am, as I uh, am becoming more aware, I was one of the very rare and lucky people who started out uh, way back when as an undergraduate uh, connected to what was then the early basis of evidence about reading, um, about instruction in general, but reading specifically. Um, I was attending the University of Oregon, and I was attending that because I lived in that town, Eugene, Oregon. Um, I didn't really have a lot of other options and resources, so there I was, and I had long wanted to be a teacher, so I entered teacher education as an undergraduate. Um, and as as a junior, that's when I started taking the education courses. You know, first two years for everybody is kind of the same. So in my junior year, I started taking courses that were supposed to be, they were the courses I was supposed to take to become a teacher. And um, for whatever reason, um, the way I analyze things or whatever, um, I was very unhappy with those early courses. I just felt that they were talking about teaching, but how do I, be, how do I learn? How, you're not telling me how to do it. And I was just very frustrated. And uh, in one of those kind of mediocre <laughs> classes that I took. One of them was a music class. And one day in the music, w one of our assignments in that music class is we all had to uh, make up a lesson, teach a lesson. Uh, I have no recollection of what I decided to teach, but we all did these lessons in front of each other. And one of my, uh, one of my peers, one of my fellow students did a lesson um, at a piano. She was teaching us to recognize a note. So she was playing the piano you know, ding, ding, ding. This is a C. This is a C. What is this? C. And then she, ding, ding, ding. This is not a C. Is this a C? No, this is not a C. Ding, ding, ding. This is a C. I just like, I'd never seen anything like that in my life. And afterwards, I went right up to her and said, what was that? Um, and she said, that's called direct instruction. And this was 1972. And uh, she said, if you're interested in learning more, uh, right across campus, there's some people, uh, Zig Engelman and people who are teaching, and they're looking for people to uh, come into their program and learn direct instruction. So uh, I signed up immediately, and uh, Zig was my, Zig Engelman, the father, inventor of direct instruction, um, mm -hmm. was my first professor of reading. So I really didn't have to unlearn anything. I, I learned uh, from Zig himself what explicit, systematic, uh, 
powerful, positive instruction looked like. Um, And I did that my whole career and taught children using direct instruction, but taught uh, my students once I was at the university um, how to do broadly explicit systematic instruction because ZIG is often associated with a set of programs, published programs that still do exist that have amazing evidence of their effectiveness, but they're not widely used in schools. So we want to take the principles of explicit systematic instruction, which these days with more learning, um, I would be so curious to know what Zig would think about the new learnings that have happened since he discovered this way of teaching. Uh, Because we we're now talking a lot about structured literacy as a, a framework Uh, to wrap our heads around all this complexity, which addresses some of the what needs to be taught and how do we do it. And when we look at the how, many of the principles that Zig really intuited, he he just figured it out um, of being explicit and systematic in instruction is definitely a, a, a component piece of what we would now call structured literacy. And direct instruction would fit very nicely within structured literacy. And structured literacy, you also hear some people say, well, that's not for, or that's just for dyslexic kids, or that's not for English learners. Can you talk about, or just say out loud that structured literacy is okay for (laughs) every kind of kid there is, even gifted kids, I mean, struggling readers, everybody. Yes. What we know um, from the evidence that we have across the range of children and needs and backgrounds, so English learners, children who are gifted, children who are twice exceptional, who are gifted but may have uh, dyslexia or other kind of learning challenges, components of structured literacy are valuable for all of those students, absolutely. The difference across that spectrum, and I often think about the spectrum now in terms of the way that Uh, My friend and colleague Nancy Young uh, identified them in a lovely infographic, um, originally called The Ladder of Reading, and now she's expanded it to be The Ladder of Reading and Writing. Um, And on the basic message of that infographic is all children can be taught to be literate, to read, write, and spell. Some are going, the latter is the journey to become literate. And the message of the latter is, while while the truth is absolutely that all children can get there, some are going to have uh, an easier process, an easier uh, journey up up that ladder. But to get children up the ladder, what, what we do know, and she articulates that on the infographic as well, is that the children um, that she has at the bottom of, of the continuum, which are children with dyslexia and other learning challenges, they the the research that we have to date just keeps confirming. So I'm quite c- convinced that those children absolutely need the most structured literacy, st- structured um, support, structured um, uh, instruction that we can provide them. Um, she has four gradations on this and the next one up is, is uh, and she color codes them. So the red band is children with dyslexia and other learning challenges. The orange are kids who will find learning to read somewhat difficult. We know for those children that aspects of structured literacy is definitely, um, well, structured literacy is valuable for them, but we may need less intensity, um, less uh, dosage is a word that we're often talking about. Then we have on her ladder, the green and the dark green. Um, And we know that the children in the green, she defines that band or that category as children who find find learning to read relatively easy. Those are the children that we know, and it's somewhere probably, I mean, we're talking about human beings, so we don't know precisely, but maybe about 40, 45% of children are your neurotypical, uh, relatively unchallenged kids with strong language base or whatever it is that makes it just kind of easy. And those are the children that we do have some evidence. Those are uh, a big chunk of our students in the cl- in classrooms that no matter what we do, if we provide some kind of instruction, they probably turn out pretty well. But 
there is some uh, when those children, neurotypical, average performing kind of children, have been involved in more carefully designed instruction that does use uh, structured literacy, they do even better. And it's not necessarily that their reading is better because their reading is pretty good already no matter what we do, but their writing and their spelling is significantly better with structured literacy. And then we have those lucky kids at the top, the dark green, who uh, the people who research those children, perhaps about 5% of the population. Uh, the research term is precocious readers, um, that uh, they just... They have the capability, whatever, to essentially teach themselves to read. So reading comes very easily to those children. Those are the children that show some evidence of reading around three years old and are often quite capable readers around four years old with seemingly no instruction at all. They just sort of picked it up. But even with those children, when we use some aspects of structured literacy, particularly again around writing, which is so much more complicated than learning to read, and spelling, um, and use the, what I think is the real message and philosophy around structured literacy is to take every child where they are and take them as far as they can go. When we have that philosophy around the kids in the dark green who are already advanced, let's make sure that they continue to advance. Um, we don't just say, oh, you're fine, great. Um, so in a well-designed differentiated classroom that embraces structured literacy. Yes, we would use systematic explicit instruction with all the children in the areas that they need it, but we would carefully be watching, and that's one of the huge challenges, uh, carefully watching the dosage that children get. These children at the top are going to need little to no instruction around how to read, um, but we have to watch that because they may have some gaps and holes because they may have been self-taught or they may have had um, inadequate instruction. We want to be sure that, that all the pieces are there, but that's a very long answer to your question, Brett, but the idea of structured literacy being valuable for all, yes, but not all children need the same amount of explicit systematic instruction. Well, that's fascinating because I say that very casually, but to hear you go through methodically and talk about it each level, and what a refreshing outlook to, and that's one of the, this part of our mission is to help children reach their potential. Yes. Not just good enough because they can or, you know, whatever, but actually to reach their potential. That's just dreamy to me. It is dreamy. And it, it, it's kind of a dream too, in terms of reality, because there's not a whole lot of people, a lot of systems that have figured out how to do that. But um, the knowledge is out there. That's also part of your question is why is, why is that knowledge out there and so disconnected from the classroom? And that is, uh, that is a, a, a really big, big challenge. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by IMSI, the Institute for Multisensory Education. With a deep commitment to transforming literacy outcomes for all students for over 25 years, IMSI provides effective structured literacy, professional development, and curriculum. IMSI equips educators with literacy knowledge, a complete set of classroom tools, teacher guides, lesson plans, digital resources, and implementation support to ensure all students learn to read. Rooted in the science of reading and the Orton-Gillingham methodology, IMSI's programs are explicit, systematic, sequential, and cumulative, guiding educators nationwide toward proficient literacy outcomes. Visit IMSI.com, that's I-M-S-E dot com, to join the growing community of educators making the IMSI impact. Parents for Reading Justice is a nonprofit grassroots movement dedicated to ensuring every child learns to read by engaging parents and educators in adopting the science of teaching reading. Please watch our award winning film, Our Dyslexic Children, take our master class, 
and to ensure all our services remain free of charge, please consider making a donation today, all at parentsforreadingjustice.org. Our parents, who kind of figured some of this out and are trying to make change in their districts, trying to bring their district to the science of reading. And we were able to do it, and now we are coaching, educating, uh, inspiring other parents to do the same thing. So there, there are certain things that, that I want to ask you about that I think will be very helpful to parents as they're trying to do this. So say you are able to, to convince a district to shift to the science of reading. You know, you've given them the evidence, you've got a relationship, um, you know, they're buying into it. But it's a huge endeavor to take a district who's been doing, you know, read and recovery, um, the balanced literacy, forget whole language, now balanced literacy, but to take a district who's been doing that, so steeped in it, and shift them to this evidence-based reading instruction, um, how, what are kind of some of the main steps that the district will have to go through as you're working with them? Uh, well, I am working with some districts. In fact, yesterday I had a quite a long conversation with a curriculum director um, who is wanting to lead that journey. She knows where her district needs to go. So we're having exactly this conversation. And uh, you've kind of jumped over the step that she's on. She's still in the position of trying to convince some of her colleagues that, that this actually can happen, that with with good structures and systems in place, 95, approximately 95% of our children are going to be able to read, write, um, and spell at least competently, if not proficiently. She knows that that can happen because she's made it happen in other situations. So right now we're at that first stage of bringing everybody on board, even with this idea. Um, and there, well, there could, yeah, please. Maybe, maybe talk about that then, because um, that is the huge first piece is how do you create that culture shift? Yeah. If that's all you've been learning about, if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, uh, our, uh, I wish I could skip over that in a way because we were talking about how, you know, how do we do it? Um, what we're going to do, uh, she and I are going to work together to share stories. I mean, sometimes it's just the stories. Here's a school um, and, and here's the characteristics of the school and here's where they were. And five years later, oh, look, 95 percent of their children are are meeting um, state standards or passing the state test or reading competently, um, that it, people need to know that it, it really is true. It's not just researchers saying this. So we're, we're, we're gathering those kinds of stories, not just the evidence, but those, those stories. We will also be sharing um, the conclusions of researchers whose conclusions about this possibility have shifted over the years. And I've got some of that documented because I've been watching that shift too. What what should we be aiming for? What is realistic? And I remember really myself being convinced that 90, 90 percent was probably reasonable to, to, to aim for. And then over the years, um, the evidence kept coming and more people that I really trust and admire started saying Louisa Motes, Sharon Vaughn, uh, Jack Fletcher, um, other researchers are saying, it's actually 95%. Um, that, that's what, and it's not all. I mean, that's what we, I, I always acknowledge. The politicians always talk about all third graders reading at third grade level. Um, and that's lovely to, stay, to say, and it's a nice political <laughs> statement. And we should aim. We shouldn't say, okay, you're the kids are not going to learn to read. But if you pay attention to science, the fact is that you need a certain level of cognitive ability to be able to do this incredibly complex thing called reading. And all brains aren't capable of that. It's about 5% of brains. And we usually know who those children are, uh, honestly, on the day they're born or soon afterwards. It's a cognitive capability. 
but all the rest of the brains we can we can train them so we want to tell those stories and give the research facts and how did those researchers come to those conclusions um, as well as stories from the field here's a school that started here and did this and this is the kind of work they did um, then how to take those first steps um, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One of them is to uh, start as early as possible that the children in kindergarten and first grade are so um, neuroplastic and we can do so much with them and it's really so important to make sure that those kids are uh, the term I'm using a lot these days is launched into successful reading. So I would want, if possible, uh, to to start our work at kindergarten and first grade. Um, the challenge of that I have found often in reality is a lot of kindergarten and first grade teachers have, um, because of their training, I think, because of their interest in working with really young children, just have a lot of difficult to shift beliefs about what they do. They have very strong sense of what's right and what's wrong in teaching five-year-old and six-year-olds. Um, and some of them are less open to be thinking about. One of the reasons I think that that's true now that I'm saying this out loud is because um, most of the children in those classrooms, kindergarten and first grade, aren't really readers yet. They're not really readers and writers. And those teachers at that level can feel fairly confident about passing those kids on to the next grade, not yet reading and writing and thinking they'll get there. I don't have to be responsible for that. So that's a little bit of a shift to help them understand that um, what they do is essentially important. And if we don't get these things done now, and we can get them done, we can get those brains ready, about 95% of the brains. So I would like to start early if I can. The second piece that I, uh, two other pieces, one is data. Um, if I can even top down demand that these schools start collecting some uh, data and I'm particularly fond of the whole suite of um, assessments that fall under that body of uh, the group of assessments called curriculum based measures and that includes those and they've been around for about 40 years um, we have good solid evidence about their trustworthiness their validity their reliability their utility their validity we've got a lot of good evidence around those assessments and they're very inexpensive if not free and they're very very short so we um and a lot of schools are using them. They not, may not be using them optimally, but they, they are collecting that data. And if they are not, that's one of the places I would start. Let's start collecting this data. It's not a huge investment in time or money or anything, but it tells them once they understand what those assessments actually tell them, it's really, really informative that we can do these little assessments of letter naming fluency. How many letters can you identify in one minute? Letter sound fluency. How many sounds of letters do you know and can you say in one minute? Um, uh, oral reading fluency. I'm going to give you a passage. Um, how many words correct in this passage can you read? All of these things now have norms so that we can uh, administer these little 60 second assessments. We can compare them to norms that we have decades of evidence to say if you're here you're likely going to be fine. If you're here we're I'm quite sure you're going to be fine. If you're here we've got some work to do. So using those assessments, I have seen sort of light bulb moments for teachers and very importantly, administrators who have to change the structures and change the, the systems that are, that are in place. Um, so starting early, using some good data. Um, and the third uh, for systems change kind of things would be to look for those people who are the most willing um, because often in a system there are the people who are like absolutely no I've read about this science of reading thing I know all they care about is phonics I'm not I'm not gonna pay any attention and then those people say 
Uh, yeah, I've been hearing about it. It doesn't sound like the way I was trained, but I'm kind of curious. And then people who may have, you know, I read an article or I read a book or I've been listening to Emily Hanford's podcast or something, they're just a little bit more ready. Or even I've been trying this in my classroom and it seems to be working. If I had limited resources and if I had a way to support those teachers, I would not invest a whole lot of time in coaching or, or paying a lot of attention to those highly resistant teachers. I would pour as much of my um, support sending those people to great conferences, making sure that they um, have some kind of coaching support or connected to um, resources on the internet or whatever um, because I've seen big payoffs for that. If we can get a one teacher fully on board, what happens is not that that teacher is then going to be saying it works, it works. What's going to happen is that the evidence is in the kids. The kids performance starts being better. The kids are reading at the end of kindergarten. They're, they're reading and writing like crazy in first grade. None of the teachers may have ever seen that before, didn't believe it could happen. And here it's happening in their own building or their own district. There's nothing that convinces most of us, but I really think teachers are very, very skeptical about things until they see it with their own eyes. So um, that's the kind of combination of things that, that I would hope, I would recommend happen. And I haven't really talked about the, the principle, but I would do all those kinds of things uh, linking arms with the principle of the building to the extent that I could because uh, principles play a big, big role in either putting up roadblocks uh, for teachers who are on this journey or um, uh, just dismissing it um, and then teachers individually, even those who are eager and open and wanting to try may, may be stymied from doing that. So we need to get our principles on board for sure. That's fascinating you say that because when we, so we came from a dyslexia standpoint and our district mm -hmm. was not complying with federal law. And so we had a lot of leverage for our dyslexic children, but we, we had no say about any other children. Right. So we were able to get Wilson in. That was one of the things that they used. Okay. And those children, when they went back into the reg ed classroom, at the, the regular education teacher said, oh my goodness, what are you doing? What are you doing? Can we pilot Wilson Foundations? And we now have it for every single student, K through three. And that's because they, exactly as you said, they saw these children, they had no idea. These are the kids that they couldn't figure out how to teach. And they learned. So it was like a Trojan horse. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, and I have seen that uh, in, with different curriculum materials and different programs. Um, the kids go out, get this special uh, uh, treatment or intervention, come back in the classroom, and the classroom teachers say, what is going on? I want, I want that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can we try it? Yeah. Yes. Um, what about – now, there's also – I, I, and maybe you have told us the most efficient way to do this because one of the things that's frustrating is as a parent, you're told that neuroplasticity wanes with time. So we have to do this yesterday. And when you talk to um, principals and the administration, they want to kind of move slowly and make sure everybody's on board and blah, blah, blah. And, and we're losing kids all that time. How, if, do you have any special... You know, Stephen Dykstra talks about it. We interviewed him. And it's yeah. just, he said, these kids have one shot at that all-important first grade year while you're taking a slow road. Is there, do you have any thoughts on how to to quickly move the district? Um no, I wish I did. If I did, I would, I would just spend, I, I would not have no time to talk to you, Brad. I would, <laughs> I would be out there sharing, here's the magic thing you do. Um, no, I wish, I wish I did. Um, and 
I'm such an admirer of Steve Dykstra. He is, he empowers my thinking and pushes my thinking and inspires me with his wonderful um, analogies a lot of the time. Uh, And he's absolutely right that we should be getting students um, in kindergarten and first grade launched because we can and we know how to do that. But I want, I'm a little bit more positive than him that uh, at least academically, um, it, the phrase that I quote from Sally Shaywitz is, is just, it's a fact that it is never too late. Um, it's always extraordinarily harder. And I know one of the things that Steve is talking about that we can't ignore is that once children have experienced, once they've experienced failure, and they start to feel that um, in the middle of first grade, if not earlier, they look around and start to feel, they notice that they're behind the other kids and they feel that they failed. And we don't want, we want to prevent that as much as prevent struggling with reading. And that doesn't go away. If we get a student in fifth grade and we can get them in good, intensive, uh, situ- instructional situations often means outside of school in tutoring, but it can be done. But they've had years of sitting in schools and going there and feeling stupid and feeling uh, just different and, and being sad and overwhelmed. Um, and we do want to prevent that. How do we do that? How do we speed up? Um, well, we want parents on board. We want parents to be pushing on schools to keep uh, doing whatever, hold up the signs that say we need to be at 90% proficient. Um, we want them to keep pushing on legislation. We want them to keep pushing against these uh, ineffective reading programs and materials. We want parents to ask for good data. Um, We're doing too much testing. So I I could go off on a tangent here with this one. We want to be very careful when we talk about data because most schools now are collecting tons of data and usually too much. Um, that overlaps or they're using ineffective data and then some effective data and they don't know what to pay attention to is so frustrating to me. Um, So it's not just more data, but if parents get more informed about things like those curriculum-based measures, those one-minute measures that um, are... They are our tools as educators. They're, they're our blood pressure assessment. They're our uh, thermometers. They are exactly like that for the medical profession. And um, a parent wants to know the data if, they, if their child is seeing a physician. What, what was their body temperature? What, what, what are you seeing in terms of data? And parents need to be asking for that kind of data as well. It should be available. Um, and it tells so much about not only what each individual child is doing, but how the system is doing. You can look at those scores across a first grade uh, classroom and say, uh, things are going well in this classroom or they are not. Um, It's very telling information. So I come back to data frequently as about how do we do this? Good data will will definitely play a role. and that's also interesting because we have seen our, our home state is Ohio. And you look at the National Association of Educational Progress, so the NAEP scores. Um, and that is very, very interesting data. So if you drop at a dinner party, only a third of children in this country are proficient readers. Nobody knows that. People do not know that. Um, but a lot of states will do something very tricky where they take their, they, they don't call it exactly the same as the name. They, and so like in Ohio, they have like very proficient, proficient, close to proficient. <laughs> so that about 60% of kids have some kind of proficient in their title. And so they make it sound like they're doing so much better. So uh, I listened to a, an interview that you did um, this morning just to kind of prep some more for this. And you were talking about um, uh, nationally norm data. 
you know, get out of your little area and look at it on a much broader scale to get a better picture of actually how your child or how your district is doing. That is one of the strengths of those CBM assessments because we do have national norms um, uh, for for all of those assessments that we can compare children to. We can compare individual children, classrooms, schools. Uh, if we have that data, it's it's um, it's quite telling, and it's sensitive data too, so that we can we can see real changes in a child between fall and winter, or winter and spring, um, and that's really important, especially at those early years. We can't wait till the end of third grade and do a comprehension assessment and say, "Oh, you you don't comprehend third grade materials." Well, we're not going to say it's too late, but oh my word, <laughs> we, we needed to predict that this was happening um, within the first few weeks of kindergarten. And, and, and we can, and we can. Well, and what we did in our district, because when I was in, when my kids were little, our district was not on board. So we hired an advocate and she would do um, the or for the oral reading fluency, just a one minute and we would then compare it to what the district was saying so that, that we had an outside objective observer that we could, that we trusted, who could tell us, you know what, it's not working. Um, so that is, and, and that's fairly simple, as you say. So it's, yeah. it wouldn't be very expensive, but it would be a way to, to get a check on your district. That's right. That's right. We can train parents to do those assessments. So if the school district is not collecting that data, um, parents can do it. You don't have to be a trained reading specialist. We, we um, often used parent volunteers, high school students, uh, instructional assistants, untrained people. It's an absolutely, if you can read, you can do those assessments. Um, and it's you don't need expertise to do that there's always the the challenge of assessing your own child so uh but the but they can be done and a lot of kids really like to do those assessments i hear people the this weekend there was a lot of activity on twitter um around fluency and i kind of tracked some of those uh, discussions and they involved assessing kids and people were talking about timed fluency assessments and that that puts so much pressure on kids and they don't like them and I'm sure that's true for some children and how you do it is really affects how the child feels about it but then somebody finally weighed in and said uh, my kids really like to have that assessment. And um, that's been my experience. Kids are curious, um, you know, about where they are. I was, when during the uh, part of the pandemic where schools were closed, uh, I was doing third grade with my grandson at my dining room table <laughs> out there. Um, and uh once a week we did and he's a good reader he, he's a fine just a fine reader um, but we wanted to track and he enjoyed doing it's one minute for one thing but we would graph his progress each week and sometimes it would go down a little bit and we would talk about that but you know on a weekly basis going down a little bit doesn't make any difference but over time his graph of course was going up and I could show him that he was right where he needed to be or even a little ahead and um, I, I I just find that kids don't mind doing those assessments if if it's presented in the right way. That's not like problematic or you need to be as fast as possible because that's not no 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 you don't. We're we're taking your temperature here. I want to know your best reading, but but that's another thing that parents could do if they were curious. They could um, figure out how to do those assessments. Where where do where would a parent access the uh, like a little mini training module, we could put that on our website. I think that's fascinating. Or in our master class, we have a master class to help oh. parents yeah. um, do this advocacy work. But part of it is teaching them, you know, about reading, about mm -hmm. so where where would you access that? Interventioncentral.com. Interventioncentral.com. Oh, mm -hmm. perfect. 
Yes, uh, uh, there is a, a guy out there, Jim Wright, who has be, is a fan of curriculum-based measurement, and for many years he has really supported the use of those assessments. Um, I'm not sure. That's where I would start. There might be. I'm not. Sh- and another place would be um, uh, reading rockets where it would be helpful probably to see some videos of people doing those assessments. But uh, Intervention Central has assessments downloadable. You can just go there and download assessments for kindergarten, first grade, or you can make your own. You can take um, one of your child's books and type in a passage and it will turn it into an assessment. Um, And the basic guidelines for how to do that are um, on that website. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. That's perfect. Um, so let me move into what I, I was going to talk about, uh, you know, what are kind of the key uh, key components of a really good reading system. Um, but what, what about if I said, you know, what if you had a brand new school with brand new teachers Everything was clean. You didn't have to, you know, do a renovation. You could do a new build. What would be, uh, and if you if you can talk about uh, the names of things or the, the names of the programs or really good resources, that's what's so frustrating as a parent. They'll say, you need a program that does this, this, and this, and, and no one will ever say, that means this exact core reading program, this or this. Don't pick yeah. anything else. Pick one of those three. Yeah. Um, yes, and I think I think a lot of of us, uh, I'll put me included in this, are s- somewhat reluctant to name names for programs for varieties of reasons. One of the one is that there isn't one perfect program, the one that's going to be that much better for all kids. Um, there are some intervention programs that that maybe are so so particularly good. But even in intervention programs, um, there's there might be two or three that I would turn to. Um, and another uh, consideration is um, just uh, many of us who have been around for a while have been associated or are associated with certain programs, and then we have the you know sometimes the the legal, if not the ethical responsibility to make those kind of affiliations clear. So I can say that there are people um, for varieties of reasons who would not recommend the use of a core reading program. Um, And I think there are some arguments pro and con for that. However, I am an author of a core reading program. So I have to make that really clear in terms of my um, my uh, connections. Uh, I, I serve on, uh, I work with McGraw-Hill uh, and I have for many, many years um, and on their core reading program, the current version of which is Wonders. And I'm one of the authors of that along with Tim Shanahan and Doug Fisher and uh, Diane August and uh, a number of other really esteemed colleagues and we do our level best. I I see on the internet all the time people uh, saying, oh, you know, never use wonders and and we tried wonders and it didn't work and uh, that's kind of hard to and, and it's not based on science and I understand that there, no program is perfect, and it may have not been a good match for a particular situation, or they may have not have had the support um, to use the program. Wonders, like a few other comprehensive core programs, is is just that. It is comprehensive. There's a lot in there. It's very different than something like Foundations, which is clean and sleek and designed to be used with these children. Um, 
a, a core reading program has everything in it from your dark green readers thinking about Nancy Young's ladder, your dark green to the red. Um, and it has, it covers language development. It covers all the aspects of word recognition. Um, and some kids are going to need very little. So we need to get them ready and go off and do this. And these kids need a lot more. So we have to have that. So I, I, you know, people can say it's a, a bloated program. There's just too much there. Um, it's a it's a comprehensive program. It's I wouldn't use the term bloated at all, but it has lots of stuff in there. And without some guidance and support, it can feel overwhelming to a teacher. But um, I am I wouldn't be doing this work if I didn't have belief in the value of a comprehensive core program that has been well designed, that does follow a scope and sequence. That's that's one of the things that makes a program good. There's a scope and sequence, and uh, there is among researchers uh, there's absolute agreement that there is no perfect scope and sequence. So we can't just say oh, if the program uses this scope and sequence, it's good. There, there, there isn't a perfect one, but a carefully chosen one. What letter sounds do we start with? What order? How quickly do we introduce them? That's all part of the work that we do as authors. Um, um, you know, how much decodable text do we use? And then how do we help children move into more traditional text and uh, all the supports for that? And keeping in mind the full range of children too. So um, uh, I think we want parents to be looking at high quality programs and there are, um, uh, and so it's, yeah, I, I know just like, there's not the list of here are the five you should go, you should go <laughs> look at, but they should have, um, I think I, I've already mentioned the Reading League. The Reading League does have a um, evaluation tool and it's pr about curriculum materials. And it is one of the better ones that I've seen. Um, they leave it to you, whereas some groups like What Works Clearinghouse and others have evaluated programs. But for a variety of reasons, when I look at those evaluations, they kind of like pretty much everything comes out looking pretty good. And I, I, I question that. So I don't send people to What Works Clearinghouse. Um, but unfortunately, um, I don't know of any better one where somebody else has done that work. But what the Reading League has is an evaluation tool, a checklist um, that can be used to say, here are some things that the program, sh the, a good high quality program should have. They also say in their checklist, here's some things that should not be there. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a value too. It's little red flags. If you're, you're seeing these kinds of wording or these kinds of phrases, um, that would be a red flag of, of concern. Um, but I guess, you know, I would say more than programs make a difference. They do make a difference. I'm a believer in good curriculum. But if the school, if the children are doing well, I would worry less about how they got there. Um, I, I think that we do need to be, how, where are our children when they are leaving first grade in terms of their ability? Do they know their letter sounds? Do they know their letter names? Are they decoding simple words? Um, are they working, is there, are their classrooms working on language to keep that, that continuing to move? We can judge the quality of what they're doing based on how the kids are doing um, as they leave each one of those or how they're making, how they're progressing through each of those stages. Um, so sort of a backwards way of looking at whether the curriculum is working or not. What would you say, you know, we all focus and I, I do it myself because the biggest bang for the buck is kindergarten first, second, you know, kindergarten and first room. But what do you do with kids? So say for example, in our district, we were able to convince our district that they had to do something different for the dyslexic children. And that then kind of through the back door, they helped all students. Yeah. But we had, and once we saw it, it was so horrifying because we saw what was possible. And there were all of our children in junior high and high school that had never received anything. So. Do you have any recommendations about how to, how do you start helping those kids? Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, this, this is, I'm so glad you brought that up. And it's so important that we do that and not write those kids off. This, this is where the Sally Shaywitz's it's never too late idea comes in. Um, and, uh, we do have some good materials for those kids. It's, it's sad that we have to consider using them, but we always will, no matter what, for varieties of reasons. Um, there are some good intervention programs that are specifically designed for older children. And one of the newest ones, and I'm doing a lot of promoting, and this is a commercial program, and this is one I have no skin in the game in at all. Um, I'm simply, I know the author. Um, I know the quality of the work she does, and I'm seeing some of the evidence. So the program's name is The Third Quest. That's the name of it, The Third Quest. The author is Marilyn Sprick. She and I um, started our journey when you asked me way back at the beginning uh, of, of how I got started with the science of reading. It was at the University of Oregon studying direct instruction with Zig Engelman. And Marilyn was doing the same thing. We we were in those course courses together and learning from Zig Engelman. So I know her um, her uh, pedigree, if you will. She is a direct instruction trained person. And when we both started teaching, she went into teaching middle school. I went into teaching elementary. But um, that was, you know, a long time ago. But her heart has always kind of been with those middle school and high school kids that just didn't get started correctly. So she's written The Third Quest as a comprehensive intervention program geared for middle school and high school students. Um, and it's, it is fairly new, but uh, I am definitely spreading the word. You can go to the website. In fact, if you just uh, go on the internet and search for it, The Third Quest, T-H-I-R-D, written out. It will take you to their website where you can see more about the program, how it's implemented. But what really touched my heart was testimonials from kids um, who have been through the program um, and just saying, you know, I didn't know how to read and now I know how to read. And, um, and they, they are feeling empowered by the program. They enjoy the program. So I, I wish, um, more people would know about that and then commit to doing it because that kind of work with older kids um, is much more complicated than teaching a kindergarten or first grade class. It's, it's, you've got to, you've got to do a, a lot with those children to reconfigure and rewire their brains. And you've got, as Steve Dykstra would point out, years of feeling like a, a failure, uh, incompetent, stupid, um, so I, that's one thing I would go take a look at right away would be that, that new um, program. I think it's going to be a, a real game changer. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Do Excellent. Link. Uh, let me ask another question. If you, so the, the, the source kind of of all of these issues, in my humble opinion, is that the colleges of education are not really keeping up with this science. And so they continue to graduate teachers who, and educate administrators, people can have a PhD and know nothing about the latest science and how to teach children to read. So they're becoming obsolete if they're not, if they're not careful. Um, but how do, do you see a role for parents in helping teacher prep programs, colleges of education in kind of coming to the science? That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about the role of parents in doing that work. Uh, I mean, I've certainly been aware that the colleges of education were not doing that because I was a product of that. I was, as a 19 year old, wanting to become a teacher. I was, my professors did not know how to do that, um, for the most part. Uh, then I became a professor and uh, I did know how to do it. I made sure my students did, but all around me, I knew, and that's one of the reasons I am no longer at a university, that I was just too frustrated with the, with my colleagues who were just stuck in this ineffective, philosophically driven um, methodology. So I thought I can do more good outside of universities. How do we change that? I know a lot of parents are very focused on getting legislation uh, around dyslexia and that that's good and that's going to have a good payoff. 
We can also, I, I, I think one of the ways that we might have an impact on the colleges of ed, because in general, they are um, accountability free. It, no matter what they do, um, uh, it, they continue to get funding and they continue to stay tenured and all kinds of things, which wouldn't happen in a medical school because if the if the doctors went out and were unable to uh, practice medicine effectively, people would start to say, we're not going to hire those doctors anymore that come out of that um, program. So we need to have accountability. If we could get some legislation that said we're going to track the performance of teachers. We're going to, we're going to, um, or do assessments of teachers. And I know some, some, um, states have played around with that idea. Let's get a high quality knowledge test and give that to the graduates. This, this university has said, we train these people and we certify they are ready to teach. Then the state gives them a knowledge test. And that's really all we could do would be a knowledge to sit down and take this test about what do you know about phoneme awareness? What's the, what is, what is, you know, how would you teach that? Is this an example of phoneme awareness? What is decodable text and what is its purpose and value and that kind of thing? If these students coming out of that situation could not pass that test and the, and the state was documenting that, the state could threaten then that that university would lose its accreditation. You can no longer accreditate, accredit teachers. And that would get the, the dean's attention and the provost's attention because teacher education for a long, long time has been a very lucrative part of, of colleges. Uh, they need those teachers coming through, those teacher candidates uh, paying tuition and those kinds of things because it's, um, it's a moneymaker for most universities. It's not very expensive. We don't have labs and all the expensive things that universities have to have in place for some subjects. It's not true for teacher education. So if, if we could prove, and there would be ways to prove that those, that the bulk of the student, the bulk of the newly certified teachers had the appropriate knowledge, then that university stays certified. If a, if a X number of those people, those new certified graduates did not have adequate information, um, the university could lose its accreditation. I think that that's, that's a power play that I think has been underutilized um, and for varieties of reasons. Uh, lack of awareness about this or cowardice or whatever it is. But I think legislation to force that, we want our teachers to have a certain level of knowledge. Uh, we want our universities to be accountable for that. There's a way to make that happen. Well, and I do think you're right because I there are pre-service tests like the foundations of reading mm -hmm. that you have to have a meaningful test score. You, yes. NCTQ does a lot of that, but I yes. find that to be a very interesting kind of a business lever. Yeah. Listen to this. Let, as a former professor, um, let me know if you think this might be, be helpful because we're planning on doing this. Um, trying to put a couple of districts together who have shifted to the science of reading, to go in to talk to the dean at the College of Education and the provost and say that to give customer feedback. Yep. So we're not using your um, program uh, that, that you have been uh, marketing, re right. reading recovery. We're not, we're not hiring as many of your graduates we are considering not allowing your student teachers to student teach in our classrooms because they don't, uh, they don't know enough. We, we, we are having to spend too much on professional development to train them. You think that would be effective? I do. I would not go to the professors. I would go to the deans and the provosts. Exactly, exactly that. Yeah, I would. Um, and I think uh, you're you're talking pocketbook issues to them, as uh, we're not going to hire your, and we're going to tell people not to hire. We're we're, we're going to um, your your reputation is uh, in our hands, and uh, and it's you can change. 
and we have a pathway for you to change. But uh, yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. I think it definitely could work. Good. Well, I'll let you know how that goes. Okay. <laughs> Um, I know that we're ending the time here, uh, but I've, I've enjoyed so much our conversation. And I, I think there's, there is, um, I think there's a place for parents who are kind of on the ground floor with the kids in the classroom and researchers who are doing the research. There's, there's a way for us to help one another. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. How, how can we help one another? Well, I think having conversations like this around our, our shared interests um, are, are, uh, is a wonderful way to go. Um, as, uh, I know a lot of my colleagues who are researchers are doing their research because they really care about what's happening with that research. So continuing conversations, uh, I, I mean, this whole new world that has opened up of social media, podcasts, um, even who knows what the future of Twitter is, but the Facebook groups, uh, the Facebook group of the science of reading, what I should have learned in college, it's getting close to 200,000 members. Uh, there is a momentum and researchers are paying attention to those Facebook groups and the Twitter groups. Um, so I think that staying connected in those kinds of ways. We have a shared mission of making uh, sure that all of our children are successful in school. And um, yeah, let's just keep talking to each other. Well, thank you. And then um, as our final question, we just sort of ask, is there anything that you would like to, to leave with parents before we conclude? Um, I would just... Uh, I'm so grateful and happy that parents have found a way to connect with each other and support each other. Uh, when I was on my uh, journey with my own ch child struggling with reading, um, pre-internet, <laughs> it was a very isolating uh, uh, place to be. So I think uh, this coming together, um, uh, sharing your journeys, um, uh, connecting and, and forming powerful groups that, that have a strong voice and people will listen to. Um, I just want to, to congratulate parents and, uh, to encourage them to continue this journey because changes are happening. Um, and it is being driven in large part by parents. Um, so I'm, I'm watching all this kind of from the sidelines at this point and helping in any way I can. But parents are powerful sources of change in this in this world, and the effects are are being felt. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today. You're very welcome, Brett. Literacy Now is a podcast designed specifically for parents in our effort to ensure every child learns to read. Parents deserve a seat at the table, and we bring their voices to the fore. We invite you to join the Parents for Reading Justice community on all of our socials, and make sure to visit our website to watch our documentary and to take our masterclass. All of our content is free of charge because every child deserves to learn to read. This episode was brought to you by ParentsForReadingJustice.org, produced by Brett Tingley and Keita Mascaro.